I suppose I'll start by first of all thanking everyone very much for attending today and taking the time to join us on this talk on International Women's Day, where we're going to be looking at women's suffrage and Royal Holloway and Bedford College. Before I do kind of get into the main parts of it, there's a few people I really do need to thank for actually helping me with this. Uh, the first two of which are Dr. Michaela Jones and Dr. Laura McCulloch, who's helping me with the chat today. They've been absolutely fantastic helping with the research, talking through ideas and listening through me practice it as well, which they didn't fall asleep during the practice. So that bodes well, in my opinion. I also want to mention uh, Annabelle Valentine and Ellis Hoddart as well, who are the previous archivist and archivist assistant that we used to have in post at Royal Holloway. Unfortunately, the post's vacant at the moment, but hopefully that will be something that changes in the future. But I do want to mention them in terms of, uh, I only have my introduction to the Royal Holloway archives because of them. So this whole talk and my whole knowledge of the archives that we'll be talking about today, I'm standing on their shoulders. So I do need to acknowledge and recognize that and thank them. In terms of the information in this talk, I'm gonna be drawing upon digitized archival resources that we have available from the college. And also I just want to acknowledge like the National Archives, the Women's Library Archives and Exploring Stories Past, which has helped me kind of with a bit of the research around some of the people that I am going to be talking about today. Now, going into the actual talk then, in terms of women's suffrage, Bedford College and Royal Holloway, before we start talking about the colleges and some of their alumni and their involvement in the suffrage movement, we need to understand the historical context that these colleges are sitting in and that the suffrage movement is sitting in. In that sense, when we're talking about the colleges, it's a fair assumption to say, and you're quite right, that the vast majority of staff and students at the college, it seems to show, are in favour of women's suffrage. However, this doesn't really reveal the kind of complexities of the debate, the layers to it, and also the political climate that the colleges were operating in at the time. Women's higher education since the establishment of Bedford in 1849 and of course Royal Holloway later in 1886 have been under scrutiny. There's these kind of accusations or arguments that uh, women and their involvement in education, that they're overly emotional, education will affect their fertility, getting an education will lead to the breakdown of households and societies. And that's just women's education. You can see if we're drawing a Venn diagram, there's a bit of overlap here in terms of some of the arguments against women's suffrage, that if women are educated, they're not focused on the home. There's this argument at the time as well that women aren't imperially minded, that they don't have a mind of a bigger picture in the empire because they're so focused on the domestic. There's this idea as well that uh, women becoming educated and becoming involved in the workforce uh, dilutes the wages of men. It makes uh, the job market more competitive and it's breaking down this kind of uh, traditional hierarchical society that does exist at the time. Now, all of this context, the colleges sit in them. And so what they are as institutions are they're very concerned about doing anything or being seen to have any opinions or actions which add any sort of credence to these accusations, especially any sort of association with militancy, which was a divisive kind of tactic used by the suffragette at the time anyway. However, they have to balance this against what are the prevailing pro-suffrage opinions of staff and students at the colleges. There's evidence to suggest, obviously, that the principals at the time, while being unable to say anything in official capacity in their role as principal or as a spokesperson at the college, were independently supportive of women's suffrage and of the college's suffrage, respective suffrage societies. The fact that many students went on to take active roles in suffrage organisations, some of whom we'll look at today, kind of shows as well the prevailing attitude that was within the student body and is evidenced within our archives. The thing we've got to acknowledge as well is that there are divisions within the suffrage movement itself. There are female anti-suffrage um, speakers and are people who argue that point. And some of this, again, is reflected within staff and student bodies to some extent, and also divisions around whether militant tactics are appropriate or not. And so while some of the reasons that argue against anti-suffrage are difficult to kind of get your head around from a modern lens, it's something we need to be appreciating when we look at how Bedford and Royal Holloway's institutions react to suffragism. So let's have a look at Bedford College then 
and its role in terms of an institution of, and especially the student societies as well of how this all started to play in to the suffrage question. So the founder, Elizabeth Jessa Reed. We know from private correspondence that she was in favour of women's suffrage, but so far as we're aware, or suppose I'm aware from what I've been able to research, there's not been any explicit public statement made by her to that effect. We know that she was supportive of uh, Sarah Parker Remond, who we've done a previous talk on, who was involved in the abolition movement, but also was very pro-women's suffrage. And Sir Elizabeth Jessa Reed, apart from housing her while she was in the UK for a period of time, encouraged her to attend talks around these topics and to be speaking at them as well. So we know that kind of discussion and involvement in early suffrage movement was not discouraged at all. It was actively encouraged by Elizabeth Jessa Reed. We know as well then from later Principal Margaret Chu, she was a member of the um, Conservative Women's Franchise Association in an independent capacity. We know from newspaper clippings that she attended talks and discussions by the organisation and in an independent capacity did speak in one debate at the organisation from on a pro-suffrage platform. And again, this is something you kind of expect from a principal of a women's higher education institute to be in favour of women's rights and the votes for women. But it's remembering here that there's a distinction. They're doing this in an official, sorry, an unofficial capacity. They're not a representative of Bedford College. They're doing it independently. And this is typical of not just Bedford, but Royal Holloway's approach in that individuals were allowed their opinions, but the college themselves couldn't take, well, wouldn't take a position. A lot of our kind of knowledge around the, the general consensus of the student body and their opinions on the question of women's suffrage comes from our archival records around the debating society and also the suffrage society that was set up at Bedford College, along with the student magazine, The Balance. Now, the student magazine to begin with is called The Balance, and this is a magazine that is published entirely to discuss women's suffrage. So the title in itself is revealing in terms of how the college is approaching this in a kind of public capacity, as in they're showing both sides of the argument. And this is something that becomes a common trend between not just the publication in The Balance, but also in the debating societies and the suffrage societies as well, that they are almost at pains to make sure that they are discussing fairly and equally both sides of the women's suffrage question, pro and anti-suffrage. So The Balance, as a magazine, they gave equal space to pro and anti-suffrage voices, but in terms of pro-suffrage articles, they had articles by leading figures such as Millicent Fawcett. So speaking about um, more peaceful demonstration and active discourse around the women's question, and also Lady Betty Balfour as well, who was very much at the forefront of the suffrage movement at the time. The 19, 1904, the Debating Society, which I want to kind of bring that full circle at the end, so kind of keep this in mind for the rest of the talk, but they debated in 1904 the assertion that the invasion by women of spheres of work, hitherto the monopoly of men, is deplorable. And that was the statement that they were discussing. So the wording of that, while hyperbolic in nature, shows that there's this setup as in they're at pains to show both sides of this argument. Another debate that we had that they, they had that we know from the records was on whether the actions of the suffragettes is commendable. It's not recorded what the outcome of that debate was because there was always a vote held at the end, but the fact that they're presenting that question in that manner kind of shows you that there is perhaps a little bit of a division within it, but certain prevailing attitudes that may have existed within the student body. Another debate as well shown within the archival records was on sex should not be a barrier to parliamentary suffrage. And this in the records, it shows that there was a large attendance of both students and external visitors to this debate. And the account of this, it's almost meticulous in pointing out that both sides of the argument were discussed equally. Now, we know from the records here that the vote ended actually 69 to 68 in favour of the subjects uh, so in favour of the statement, so pro-suffrage. So that's quite interesting. It's a very, very close vote, but the person who's recording this does say that they don't believe it was representative because of the number of external visitors that did attend the talk. So it almost sounds a little bit like the meeting was kind of bombed by a particular demographic who are arguing an anti-suffrage position against what would have perhaps predominantly been seen as a pro-suffrage student body. 
There was also another motion in a later debate that the House of Lords should be replaced by a House of Ladies. Interestingly, that was actually defeated by two votes in the debate. Now, building on that, our archival records for the Society of the Study of Women's Franchise at Bedford College show they held regular, well-attended meetings and they invited speakers again who were speaking for both sides of the debate. And so again, we've got this idea that the student body on the whole and the staff as well are pro-suffrage, but they're at pains in this kind of under this public scrutiny to be giving equal space to both sides of it. Now, some of the notes that we have on one of the anti-suffrage speakers was that they were treated cordially, but they did also write that their attendance only served to confirm our faith in the suffrage. So this idea that they were entertaining these anti-suffrage speakers, but if anything it was doing, it was only confirming more for those in attendance that pro-suffrage was the right course of action. There doesn't appear to have been really any restrictions placed on students by the college in attending suffrage meetings. And in that sense, even in official capacity, because we know in one instance from the records, where the Suffrage Society did actually try and get tickets to an event at the Albert Hall for an anti-suffrage talk. They were unable to do so for whatever reason, and some students did actually end up attending the talk in an unofficial capacity, as it's worded, so I don't know if they kind of gate-crashed the meeting. But from that, we can kind of infer that the Society itself wasn't banned from attending talks, that not to say that they were encouraged or discouraged, but there wasn't any um, prohibition on them doing so. And that's quite interesting, especially when we contrast that to Royal Holloway later on. There's one particular story of note in the archives that I found a bit interesting in that quite late on, just before the outbreak of the First World War, they held a, a college-wide debate on the suffrage question which was chaired by the principal at the time, Margaret Tuke. In the record, it's noted that... Um, they couldn't actually find a member of staff or anyone to argue the anti-suffrage position. And so from that, they actually had to press gang an unfortunate member of staff called Mr. Allen into all out arguing the anti-suffrage as no one else would come forward to do it. So actually, I'm just flashing up on the screen here a few kind of little pieces of that we do have from the records. And we can see here an extract from some of the uh, notes around the suffrage society. Now, Bedford, in that sense, as an institution, has this kind of difficult relationship with suffrage, even though the individual students who are attending and staff have a clear kind of agenda towards the pro-suffrage movement. One of the people that I want to talk about then is actually Barbara Bodeshan, and she's an interesting graduate of Bedford College for a number of reasons. The first of which is she was one of the original students to attend Bedford College in its inaugural year. And also then because of her central role in the early suffrage movement. Now a little bit of background to uh, Bodeshan to kind of give you some context of where she's coming from and I think which really does inform some of her opinions later in life is that she's a daughter born out of wedlock of Whig politician Benjamin Lee Smith. Now, there's a social stigma involved in being born out of wedlock at the time, but Smith, he continues the relationship with Barbara's mother and has several more children with them and does maintain his relationship, even though, from what I can tell from the research, they don't ever actually marry. Smith himself was a member of parliament who was a radical dissenter, a Unitarian, supporter of free trade, a benefactor to the poor as well and he's known for building a school in Westminster for poor children and also he sent his own children to free schools that were attended by children from different social groups he didn't pay for their education which he could certainly afford to do now this is an experience then kind of growing up that I think really you can start seeing how it starts informing Bodeshan's actions and some of her opinions later on in life at her age of maturity, so at the age of 21, her father gave each of children a stipend of £300 a year, which is the equivalent, if my maths is correct, of about £40,000 today. And this is a bit unusual, especially for women to have their money to be independent of means that they don't have to be reliant on their family to live. And this enables her to attend Bedford College in its inaugural year to study as an artist. Now, through her studies, 
she's obviously meeting people at Bedford and that's again something I want to kind of bring back round full circle towards the end of the talk but graduating from Bedford then being financially stable to provide for herself she's not under pressure to go out and earn a living she can actually now at this point focus her efforts on removing women's legal disabilities which is then she how she approaches this in a couple of different ways the first was through education and kind of following in the footsteps of her father what she does in 1862 is help establish portman horse school in paddington now this was a non-denominational school for boys and girls and open to all classes in society what she does from this as well is then put a lot of her time money and effort into setting up girton college in cambridge which is the first women's college opened in cambridge she does this in conjunction with emily davis who has a bit of overlap here to someone other people we're going to be talking about later as emily davis is friends with elizabeth garrett anderson and millicent Fawcett, who i'll be talking about a bit more later and there's this little bit of something here about different people's stories starting to overlap from Bedford, from Royal Holloway and the suffrage movement. But a lot of these actions that she took around education are really can be seen as a manifestation of a strong belief in equal access to education for both genders and all classes in society. And especially for women, she sees this as a kind of stepping point for a kind of social and political mobility. The other approach that she used alongside education was through discourse and demonstration. She wrote a number of different um, publications, one of which was the brief summary in plain language of the most important laws concerning women. And she also gave evidence to the House of Commons Committee on the legal position of married women. Some of the consequences of these were some influence on the 1857 Matrimonial Causes Act, giving women more protection in divorce courts, and also the 1870 Women's Property Act, which for the first time allowed women to keep earnings independent of their husband and that it would also retain any inherited assets as well. And she, with through her involvement in publications, discourse and demonstration, is instrumental in these acts getting passed. She's also one of the co-founders of the English Woman's Journal in 1858. And this journal is published with the purpose of discussion of the reform of laws pertaining to the sexes. And this publication is important because it gives a platform to women to demonstrate and forward arguments around women's rights and also votes for women. And it enables them to have this platform in an arena where they can show and demonstrate and engage in political discourse, to political debate and to be demonstrating their intellect. These weren't arenas that were necessarily afforded them elsewhere. And so Bodeshan and her kind of approach to this is to create these arenas for them. Bodeshan's also instrumental in the foundation of the women's suffrage movement as the co-founder of the Langham Place Group. During the 1850s, uh, at number 19 Langham Place, she helped set up a reading room, coffee shop, meeting place for women to come and discuss and debate political topics. And these were set up in a direct counterpart to kind of the gentlemen's meeting clubs that were around London at the time. These were clubs run for men that were exclusively for men and women weren't allowed to enter. So they set their own up. And again, this gives a meeting place somewhere where women can come and start discussing these issues, being involved in that political discussion. From this group, Bodeshan helps form the first ever Women's Suffrage Committee in 1866. And this can really be seen as the precursor to the National Society for Women's Suffrage in 1872, which later becomes the National Union of Women's Suffrage Societies, the NUWSS. And obviously, even later on, the Women's Social and Political Union, the WSPU in 1903. So she can really be seen as kind of laying this groundwork, the precursor to these later nationally important movements and organisations. Now, this committee that she sets up are very instrumental in organising the 1866 suffrage petition that was presented to the House of Commons on June 1866 by MP John Stuart Mill. Now, this is the first large scale dedicated uh, petition presented to Parliament on the question of women's suffrage. And she's one of the people who are instrumental behind this. We also know as well that Sarah Parker Remond was one of the people to have signed this as another Bedford College alumni. Now, regretfully, in 1877, Bodeshan was taken ill. And though she recovers, she's actually left paralysed from the illness. And because of this, 
she's no longer able to take a kind of active role in the movement, even though she does retain her interest in women's rights and the suffrage question. Now, she remains an invalid, unfortunately, until her death in June 1891. But really, when I think back on like the research that I've done, my reflection on her, I really want to kind of call Barbara Bajan the first of firsts in that she was one of the first students to attend Bedford College in its first year. She helped establish the first women's college in Cambridge, the first to help provide physical and print spaces for women to engage in political discourse and was involved in the first official group focused on women's suffrage that presented the first large scale petition to Parliament on the suffrage question. And so the kind of story that I want to draw through here or the thread that I want to draw through here in terms of her contribution is she's the first to lay this groundwork. This Bedford College alumni who studied art, she's been afforded a bit of privilege in her life, but she's used it to really pioneer the kind of grassroots, the seeds of this movement. Now, stepping off from that, then the next person I actually want to talk about then is Louisa Garrett Anderson. And a little bit of the name might be familiar in the sense as in she's actually the daughter of Elizabeth Garrett Anderson, who was the first female in Britain to qualify as a physician and a surgeon and was also a prominent member of the National Union of Women's Suffrage Societies herself. Louisa's aunt is Millicent Fawcett, who is the leader of the NUWSS. And so her family in that sense, you can see there's some very strong high profile links advocating peaceful protest and discourse. And this is something that plays quite an integral role in Louisa's later life. Now, Louisa attended Bedford College in the early 1890s and then went on to the London School of Medicine for Women, where she achieved her doctor in medicine in 1900. And after that, she spent quite a period of time traveling around Europe and America observing surgeries. And so in this sense, she's following a little bit in the footsteps of her mother, who's pioneered this career that she's now stepping into and helping raise the profile of women on as well. Now, initially, she's very active in the NUWSS alongside her mother and aunt, but does actually become frustrated with the perceived lack of progress around achieving the vote for women. In 1907, she leaves to join the WSPU. And this is kind of interesting then in terms of mentioning some of the debates that Bedford College were having around the whether the actions of the suffragettes were commendable or not. We can see here that Louisa Garrett Anderson is making that step into the militant side of the uh, organisations, the militant side of protest for the women's suffrage, and is a break from actually her mother and her aunt, who are very high profile in the counter organization to it. Now, from this, we don't think from the records that we can tell that it's really damaged the relationship with her mother at all, but there does seem to be a bit of a schism start to appear between herself and her aunt Millicent Fawcett. Fawcett writing in her memoir, What I Remember in 1924, reflected and said, I could not support a revolutionary movement, especially as it was ruled autocratically. I had no doubt whatsoever, uh, no doubt whatever, that what was right for me and the NUWSS was to keep strictly to our principle of supporting our movement only by argument based on common sense and experience and not by personal violence or law breaking of any kind. And so we can see from her own convictions there how they can start seeing this difference and divergence between herself and Louisa. Now, in November 1910, Louisa joins her mother, Emmeline Pankhurst, Princess Sophia Dully Singh, and 300 other women to petition Prime Minister, Ax uh, Prime Minister Asquith for voting rights. This particular protest became known as Black Friday due to the violence and sexual assault that was perpetrated against the protesters by the police and male bystanders. We know that more than 100 women are arrested at this event, including Louisa, but later all of them were released without charge. And so we can see there's become this very active involvement in the kind of WSPU that she's there willing to put herself on the front line for this organisation, for this cause, and is being arrested for it. Two years later in 1912, she takes part in a campaign which involved the smashing of shop windows and she was subsequently arrested again and sentenced to 12 weeks in Holloway Prison. Now, interestingly, and there's a couple of reasons what Louisa argues here is that after she threatens to go on hunger strike, 
she is released by the authorities and not actually re-arrested as what was being done under the Cat and Mouse Act. Now, she believed that she was given this preferential treatment because of her high-profile family and connections in that sense, and they didn't want to be a kind of um, bad news story associated Excuse me with this. And she actually ends up writing a letter to the British Medical Journal complaining about this preferential treatment that she's achieved. And I think you can kind of say then that this is reflective of her kind of attitude of believing in equality. It shouldn't matter about your family, your social status, your wealth. People should be treated equally with whether she felt she should have been arrested and imprisoned or not. But if she was going to be, her treatment should have been the same as anyone else had. And this does draw quite an interesting kind of comparison against the treatment of Emily Wilding Davison in prison that we'll talk about later. Now, again, this kind of event kind of demonstrates this bit of a division that's within the family, especially with her aunt, because Millicent Fawcett, when she found out that Louisa had been incarcerated, wrote to Elizabeth Garrett Anderson, Louisa's mother, saying, I am in hopes that she, Louisa, will take her punishment wisely, with the, that the enforced solitude will help her see more in focus than she always does. So this kind of idea that she's only a militant because she's not thinking in a focused uh, manner on the topic. Now, after her release from prison, along with another Bedford College alumni, Flora Murray, and also Catherine Pine, they set up a, a nursing home in Notting Hill for WSPU members that are recovering from hunger strikes and other demonstrations. Now, there becomes a breaking point later on with Louisa and Flora Murray as well, especially with their relationship with the WSPU, that when the arson attacks start on homes of uh, members of Parliament, especially that of David Lloyd George, who was the Chancellor of the Exchequer at the time, they see this as a step too far and they do actually at that point break with the organisation. with a kind of, no, we, we were happy with the smashing windows, we we're happy to a point, but actually arson attacks on the homes of people where people may or may not be in residence there at the time is a step too far for us. With the advent of war then, Louisa does then fully kind of break from any suffrage activities, which was actually the directive of the WSPU at the time. And along with Flora Murray again, focused on running a hospital in France for wounded soldiers. Fellow suffragette Evelyn Sharp, who visited them in France, remarked, it was in a way a triumph for the militant movement that these two doctors who had been prominent members of the WSPU were the first to break down the prejudice of the British War Office against accepting the services of women surgeons. And there's something in this in terms of not just the votes for women, but women's rights and kind of employment opportunities that they're showing again, they're pioneering these steps into these fields, allowing then other women to come in following them. Now, with the representation of the People Act in 1918, Louisa then continued working in medicine and lived with Flora Murray. She died in November 1943, and on her death, her family arranged for an inscription commemorating her friendship and work with Flora Murray, which was placed on the latter's tombstone. So I think from a kind of objective historical lens, you can make some assumptions about the nature of their relationship as it may have been. Now, Louisa, despite the kind of shadow of her mother and aunt that she lived under in terms of her mother being the first female doctor physician, her aunt, Millicent Fawcett, being the leader of a very prominent uh, women's suffrage movement whose views are in countenance to her own, she still pioneers her own way. She still makes her own mark in the field of medicine. She still contributes in a very active way in the WSPU. And so even though this is representative of some of the divisions and divides that existed within the movement and the methods to achieve this, they were still unified by this common goal of women's suffrage and women's rights. Now, there are a lot of other kind of notable alumni that you could talk about with Bedford College. The difficulty with this talk has actually been kind of narrowing it down to a couple of examples. And what I've kind of tried to do is find ones that illustrate particular kind of arguments or points within the movements. You could almost do a talk independently on each of these people as well, but for the sake of time, that's kind of illustrative then of Bedford College and a couple of their very notable alumni and their contributions to the women's suffrage movement. Stepping off that then now, I want to talk about Royal Holloway 
and their involvement within the suffrage movement and some of their alumni. And I think one of the first things to be aware of or have in mind when we're talking about Royal Holloway is when compared to Bedford College, they're more conservative. And I say conservative with a small c in their attitude towards the question of women's suffrage. As far as I'm aware, it's entirely coincidental that the college's colours match those of the suffragettes, but I think it's a happy coincidence in that sense. And I do want to kind of say actually like um, a lot of our kind of knowledge of kind of Royal Hollow and its relationship with the suffrage movement comes from the diaries of former student Winifred Seville. And these are a couple of diaries that recount her time between 1906 and 1910 at Royal Holloway talking about the political society and the suffrage society that she was involved with and also some of the records of the debating society as well. And so it's these diaries and then some other records we've got that really do tell this story of Royal Holloway. Now, in 1906, Seville recorded in a diary that she had been to the political society meeting where there'd been a debate on the women's suffrage question. Now, this debate apparently got so heated that time had to be extended. And when the final vote came, it was 109 votes for women's suffrage and 40 against. And Winifred Seville actually was one of the people who voted against women's women getting the vote. And this, in a way, kind of illustrates these divisions between the student body that, while, as we said, broadly speaking, the students and staff are pro suffrage. But within the student body, that it is representative that there are anti suffrage minded people. Now, kind of from that as well, actually, I'm skipping a slide. So from that as well, we know that the college in 1908 formed an old students women's suffrage society and also the Royal Holloway College Women's Suffrage Society, which was for current students. The latter society, its aim was to promote interest in the cause of women's suffrage and to cooperate in such ways as may seem expedient with others who are working for the same cause. And so in that sense, you can see the purpose of the society being set up as a pro-suffrage society. And interestingly, the initial membership of the society, the archive records show that there was 49 students and also 11 members of staff joined it. These groups and organisations, the political society, the debating society and the suffrage society invited speakers to talk on the suffrage question and both sides of the debate. Again, again, the college as an institution seems at pains to always show publicly that they're providing balanced academic discourse on this question. Notably, one of their speakers does include the founder of the Women's Freedom League, Charlotte Despard, who came to the college in 1909. But going back again to Seville's records, her diaries, in 1908, she records that a chief item of discussion at a student's meeting was whether Royal Holloway should send a contingent to the women's suffrage procession being held in London that year. After discussion, the passing resolution forbid the use of the name Royal Holloway in the matter at all, which is a kind of step in a different direction to what Bedford College did that they Bedford College never, as far as we know, actively discouraged anyone from attending in an official capacity as the society, but Royal Holloway does. And this characterizes then how Royal Holloway approached the suffrage movement. They encouraged intellectual debate and engagement, but discouraged active demonstration and protest, especially in official capacity as the college. However, 70 members of the old student suffrage society wearing their graduation gowns did attend under a Royal Holloway banner as they could. They weren't banned from the college from doing it because they didn't have the sway to do that. And we do have a photo of them there with their banner in their gowns attending ready to attend that demonstration. Now, the archive records show then that later in 1912, a vote was held again on the question of women's suffrage, this time resulting in 108 votes for and 27 votes against. And so again, demonstrating that while there is this broad support at the college, there's still this kind of notable pocket of students who didn't support the enfranchisement of women. There's a number of kind of reasons around that, that link back to the historical context at the time that these colleges are operating in. The Suffrage Society as well, we know held a special library of books relating to the topic and it was noted that in 1913, the principal at the time, Ellen Hings, donated a number of books to this collection. And so this is again showing this kind of independent capacity. The principal is supportive of women's suffrage and discussion around it, 
first an institute is unwilling to take a position. Interestingly as well, and I won't go too much into this kind of event because I don't want to tread on kind of Laura's toes with the talk next week, was that in April 1913, the Picture Gallery's curator, Charles William Carey, reported that the Picture Gallery would be closed to the public until further notice in consequence of suffragette disturbances. And it's believed this is likely in response to attacks by suffragettes on property in nearby Englefield, Green and Walton on the Hill. And in that sense, the college is thinking that um, if not the college itself, but some of the items within the collection may have been targets for the suffragettes. So that's something to kind of bear in mind with Royal Holloway. And again, it's kind of reaction to the movement. Now, Royal Holloway itself does have some very notable alumni who came involved in the suffrage moves. And the first one that I want to talk about then is Rose Lamontine Yates, who's sometimes called the um, cycling suffragette. Now, she attended Royal Holloway in 1896 to study modern languages and theology. She's the daughter of French parents who were living in Lambeth, London, but she also, in her younger years, attended schools in not just London, but Kessel in Germany and Paris before then moving and studying at Royal Holloway. Now, she's sometimes called the cycling suffragette as she was the first woman elected to the governing council of the cyclists touring group in 1907. And the cyclist touring group is a cyclist group formed in 1878 to promote cycling, which organised cycling tours in the UK and on the continent. And it still runs today, I believe. Now, what's interesting here is that when Rose stood for election to the council, she made the statement that she was not a suffragette. However, a year later, when she had been elected, she wrote that although it was an honest statement at the time, it was also untrue. She stated that for looking into the matter seriously, I find I have never been anything else. Therefore, I never really became a suffragist. I was born one, and the tale I have to tell is rather how I became to realise I was and must remain one at whatever the personal cost. Now, Rose becomes an interesting kind of uh, story with, in 1908, she becomes involved with the WSPU, so the militant organisation. And it's interesting as in at the time, she has a very young child, Paul. Now, what happens in a demonstration that she was involved in where they march from Caxton Hall to the House of Commons to present a petition to the Prime Minister? Rose was seized by police officers and after being arrested along with 28 other women was charged with obstructing the police in the execution of their duty. Despite her husband acting as her defence in court, she received one month's imprisonment. She addressed the court and said, I have a little son eight months old and his father and I after calm consideration that when the boy grew up he might ask, what did you do mother in the days of the women's agitation to lay women's grievances before the Prime Minister? And should I blush if I have to say I made no attempt to go to the Prime Minister? From that, Punch magazine published a satirical verse about her, which suggested that rather the question would be, who looked after me, rather than what did she do? And she did receive quite amount of kind of a uh, criticism within the press and the media and publicly around her sentence and being seen as abandoning her son. Now, for me, there's a bit of an irony in this, if anyone's familiar with some of the World War One recruitment propaganda, especially the one which has Daddy, what did you do in the Great War, which echoes a similar sentiment. But in this instant, Rose is criticised for in her mind doing her duty to do her moral duty to further the cause of women's votes and rights. Rose defended her decision not just in court but in various spe uh, speeches she gave on her prison's experience once she was released. She said that his, her son was left in the care of her husband and a wet nurse and there's this commentary she gave on society in that well, why wasn't the father seen as an equal caregiver to the mother? Why did there have to be this kind of traditional gender roles around childcare? Why was it that she is criticised for and her husband isn't lauded as being equally adept at giving childcare? On her return as well to Wimbledon, where she was active with the WSPU, she was awarded the Holloway brooch, 
which is nothing to do with Royal Holloway, the college, but actually a brooch given to WSPU members who had served more than one week's imprisonment in Holloway Prison. From this, Rose continues to be an active member in the Wimbledon branch of the WSPU, and by 1909, she becomes their organising secretary. So on a regional level, she becomes very involved and very important. And essentially, in her capacity, she becomes an unpaid full-time worker for the organisation. She organises local meetings, enrols new members, she addresses the local gatherings, addressed at organised fundraisers, contributes to weekly reports to local, national press, suffrage press as well. And famously, every week she went to Wimbledon Common at 3pm every Sunday to give a speech on women's issues. So in this sense, you could really say that she's not only the face of the Wimbledon suffrage campaign, but she's also the driving force behind the organisation in this area and its success. Between 1909 and 1911, Rose is responsible, along with the other volunteers, for increasing the turnover of the Wimbledon branch by over a thousand percent. And so their annual income went from £23 to £328. In addition to this, she also opened up her home, Dorset Hall, to suffrage activists who were in need of recuperation from their exhausting, say, well, say daily schedules, but protests, hunger strikes and imprisonment. And notable suffragettes who stayed with her included Emily Wilding Davison, Mary Lee and Mary Gawthorpe. In 1904, with the outbreak of war, the WSPU uh, officially ceased activities protesting for the women's vote. However, Rose broke with this actually and continued meetings. The WSPU in Wimbledon is highly significant and as far as we know, they're the only branch who did actually defy this instruction from central office and continued um, activities during the war. However, Rose saw this as trying to minimise the suffering brought upon women and children in the locality by reason of the war. And while the activity she did undertake was opening a cost price restaurant, which in just one year alone served over 40,000 meals to people in the local community. After the war, Rose was one of the prime movers behind the establishment of the Women's Record House in Westminster, and she opened the Women's Record House in May 1939, which houses a vast range of suffragette material from banners, postcards and publications. After the establishment of the Record House, Rose really does kind of retire from the public life and public eye and really does now spend the rest of her time enjoying the company of her family. And in 1959, she dies at the age of 79. But her legacy really, for me, is someone who pushed back against kind of traditional gender roles, was steadfast in her conviction that she was willing to take on like the, the imprisonment that, she, that was forced upon her and separation from her son because of the moral duty that she saw within it. And even within her actions within the WSPU, a whole amount of it shows it's, it's community based, it's not just women's votes, but it's also that equality that trying to improve the social mobility of people as well. Now, the next person I'm going to speak about, and it's actually the last person I've got a chance to speak about today, because I'm very mindful of the time and I desperately don't want to run over, is Emily Wilding Davison. And before I do go into this part, I do just want to say to people that there are a couple of bits in this in terms of content that are potentially quite upsetting around some descriptions of force feeding and also attempted suicide. So what I'm going to ask for Laura in the chat, if when I do note that that content's putting up, if people do want to mute, they are welcome to, and then Laura can put into the chat then, whether um, once that part's finished, so you can then unmute again. So please just bear that in mind that there is some content in this that is potentially upsetting for some people. Now, Emily Wilding Davison enrolls at Royal Holloway in 1892 to study English literature and she was awarded a bursary for £30 for two years to do this. However, unfortunately in 1893 her father passes away and with the bursary coming to an end, she actually leaves the college at that point. From there she finds work as a teacher and a private tutor around Northampton before enrolling at the University of London in 1902 and completing her studies in 1908. Now, She's most well known, obviously, for her death while protesting at the Grand National on the 4th of June 1913. However, while that is a kind of important part of her involvement within the WSPU, I want to talk a little bit more about some of her other active and still high profile actions and protests that she did take. So I don't want necessarily the manner of her death to overshadow what was 
quite a prominent and active role within the organization. Now, she joins the WSPU in 1906 and after finishing her studies in 1908, dedicates herself to them full time. And many of her protests target the House of Commons and the parliamentary buildings. The National Archives holds, interestingly, the papers from the Sergeant of Arms detailing her various protests, which include on the 30th of March 1909, attempting to present a petition to Parliament dressed in the suffragette colours, her and a number of other protesters dashed past police in order to present the petition to Prime Minister Herbert Asquith. And for this, she was sentenced to one month in prison. And this was her first of many incarcerations. Now, Emily Wilding Davison is interesting kind of a case study, for want of a better phrase, as in many of her protests were solo protests. And that's what she's actually most well known for in that respect. One of which included entering Parliament through a ventilation shaft, in another, she broke a window in the Crown Office. And even though she was banned from parliamentary grounds in June 1910, she went on to throw a hammer through a window between the House of Commons and Lobby Chamber. And also in 1911 was later found to be trespassing at 2.23 a.m. in the morning in the crypt of the Chapel of St. Mary's Undercroft. Now, this particular event in 1911 is, for my mind, quite an interesting one, as in it was the night of the census. Now, it was the common practice of the WSPU to avoid signing the census. However, this is an interesting one, as in Emily Wilding Davison ends up with two entries in the census. The first of which is her regular entry with her normal uh, postal address. But the second one, and I've got the record here on the slide for you to see, is she was actually recorded as being the sole resident of the crypt in the Houses of Parliament. So on the record here, you probably can't make it out, but it does say on this entry here that her postal address is listed as found hiding in the crypt of Westminster Hall. And this is quite unique and interesting in that this is officially entered into the census records that Emily Wilding Davison is the sole occupant of the crypt in the Houses of Parliament in 1911. From this, you may or may not be aware, but in more recent times, members of Parliament, Tony Benn and Jeremy Corbyn, alongside uh, Helena Kennedy, actually have put a plaque on the cupboard that she was hiding in on the undercroft commemorating this particular event. Now, this is where I do want to say the next part of this talk does have a content warning with it that there's some information people may find upsetting. So you are welcome to mute at this point if you want. And Laura will put into the chat um, once I have covered it. So the next bit is going into when she was then incarcerated in a later time and went on hunger strike. And what I'm going to describe to you now is this is, in Emily's own words, a description of what happened to her within her time in prison and force feeding. And there was part of me debated whether to include this or not. And I decided to on the basis in this is the experience that she had. This is it in her own words. And it's not for me to censor it or remove it or take it. It is there for the telling and is a true part of this history. So what she described it as this in the evening, the matron two doctors and five or six wardresses entered the cell. The doctor said, I'm going to feed you by force. The scene which followed will haunt me with its horror all my life and is almost indescribable. While they held me flat, the elder doctor tried all around my mouth with a steel gag to find an opening. On the right side of my mouth, two teeth are missing. This gap he found pushed in the horrid instrument and prized open my mouth to its widest extent. Then a wardress poured liquid down my throat out of a tin enameled cup. What it was, I cannot say, but there was some medicament, which was foul to the last degree. As I would not swallow the stuff and jerked it out with my tongue, the doctor pinched my nose and somehow gripped my tongue with the gag. The torture was barbaric. During a period of incarceration in 1912, in protest and response to this treatment, along with also um, an attempt by um, some of the prison guards to flood her cell after she'd barricaded the door, she attempted to take her own life in prison. Writing on the attempt, she said, in my mind was the thought that some desperate protest must be made to put a stop to all the hideous torture, which was by now our lot. 
Therefore, as soon as I got out, I climbed onto the railing and threw myself out the wire netting, a distance of between 20 and 30 feet. The idea in my mind was one big tragedy may save many others. I realised that my best means of carrying out my purpose was the iron staircase. When a good moment came, quite deliberately, I walked upstairs and threw myself from the top as I meant onto the iron staircase. If I had been successful, I should have undoubtedly been killed as it was a clear drop of 30 to 40 feet, but I caught on the edge of the netting. I then threw myself forward on my head with all my might. I know nothing more except a fearful thud on my head. When I recovered consciousness, it was to a sense of acute agony. In this incident, Emily had cracked her skull and fractured two vertebrae, but despite these injuries, prison staff continued to force feed her. James Kerr Hardy, the leader of the Labour Party at the time, complained about her treatment in the House of Commons, and after her release, Emily took legal action against the men at Strangeways who had been responsible for her treatment. On the 19th of January 1910, a judge pronounced in Emily's favour, awarding damages of 40 shillings. Sylvia Pankhurst, daughter of Emmeline Pankhurst, described her as one of the most daring and reckless of the militants. And it was on June the 4th, 1913, Emily sustained fatal injuries after being hit with the King's horse at the Grand National. On the 14th of June, 1913, Davison's body was transported from Epsom to London, flanked, by a procession of 5,000 women wearing the suffragette colours and by hundreds of male supporters. A reported 50,000 people lined the route and the Manchester Guardian wrote the event had something of the deliberate brilliance of a military funeral and it was the last of the great suffragette spectacles. On Wednesday the 18th of October 2017, Her Royal Highness the Princess Royal and Chancellor of the University of London formally opens the Emily Wilding Davison building on Royal Holloway campus, named in her honour. So, drawing this to a close then, in that sense, the question then says, well, what was the role of Royal Holloway and Bedford College? One of the arguments made against women's suffrage was that they were not intellectually equal or as well educated as men. So surely one of the enduring legacies of both Royal Holloway and Bedford was to prove this untrue, that the opportunities they provided for women to gain a higher education gave them social, political and employment mobility. The role of the debating societies as well should not be underestimated, as these are quite formal groups with sets of rules and procedures and scrutiny that goes into the arguments presented there, and these give women the skills necessary for entering the political arena. It gives them as well an arena to be discussing these political questions in an academic context. Debating societies and clubs are traditionally the domain of men, but these institutions broke that down. They provided them for themselves. They gave a platform for women to demonstrate their intellectual acumen. The colleges and their respective societies also created the perfect meeting places for like-minded people. And this is evident in the number of graduates who went on to be involved in the suffrage movement on various levels and whose lives continue to intertwine after graduation. Aside from that as well, the number of alumni who pioneered new careers in medicine, the sciences, civil service and the arts, breaking down the doors of male-dominated arenas, Royal Holloway and Bedford were the kind of springboards for this. Now, each of the remarkable women mentioned here today played an important role in the suffrage movement, and their individual stories provide insight into the different opinions and experiences of the women involved. And it's, in that sense, my privilege to have been sharing them with you today. We're proud to have these archive records which preserve their stories and show that intrinsic link between education and equality.